What's up and welcome back to Gabe Miller Music. Today I'm going to be talking about what are the best standalone music production devices for me personally right now. And I want to provide a few important disclaimers before I get into the list. First of all, this is subject to change and is just my opinion based on what I've had a chance to use so far. Second, I have worked with a few of the companies that are represented on this list before. Roland and Novation have both sponsored videos and sent me free gear, but I place an incredibly high value on being able to say whatever I want on camera about music production gear and relationships with companies will never change that. And third, I have more groove boxes and music production devices in general than anyone reasonably needs. I'm kind of on a mission to become one of the go-to YouTubers when it comes to standalone music production devices or groove boxes as they're often called as kind of a catch-all term. And I want to make a variety of content. So I've got a lot more stuff than I need and than anyone needs. Most people only need one device uh, of this nature, maybe two, maybe three, if you really want some variety in your setup. All that being said, let's get into it. Starting with the least expensive and roughly moving my way up to the most expensive. The first device on this list is a staple for this channel, the Innovation Circuit Tracks. <laughs> The Circuit Tracks is the direct follow-up to the original Novation Circuit, which was also a huge staple of this channel, and I used it for a ton of my music production long before Novation ever got in contact with me. The Tracks is basically the better version of that, with all of the firmware updates more tightly integrated and a really intuitive interface and fantastic ability to connect with external gear, which is what you saw in that intro beat that I just played. Um, if you want to run a completely DAWless setup with multiple external synthesizers, the Trax is a great intuitive and relatively inexpensive way to get into that. Plus, of course, it's completely standalone, so you can just use it by itself. I've made a ton of music with uh, the original and with the Trax just standalone, and lately a ton of music with the Trax with external gear plugged in. You've got plenty of layers to work with that way, and it's great for a beginner because you've got an intuitive interface with a lot of room to grow, and experienced producers can absolutely get a ton out of this device. I've certainly gotten a lot of mileage out of mine, and I don't see that changing anytime soon, even though it's been slightly eclipsed by the next thing on this list, the Novation Circuit Rhythm. <laughs> When the Novation Circuit Rhythm was released, a lot of people were understandably pretty disappointed by its limitations. And I want to be clear, I totally get that, and a lot of these complaints are incredibly valid. Every track is monophonic, in other words, you can only play one note at a time on each track, sampling is mono, and there's no multi-track export, to name just a few of the major limitations that people had problems with. I totally understand why those things will be deal breakers for a lot of people. That being said, I adore my circuit rhythm. The eight tracks are plenty for me to get a full sounding mix. And the sample flip feature, AKA the ability to change between samples on one track gives me plenty of sonic variation to work with. It takes the already really good circuit workflow and makes it, in my opinion, even smoother to use, and then gives you the potentially unlimited sonic palette of using your own samples. And it's got a really good lazy sample chop feature built in as well. And at this point, the circuit rhythm is my go-to device when I just want to make music. When I come home from a long day at work and I'm kind of brain dead and tired, and I just want to tinker with making some beats, I pretty much instinctively reach for the circuit rhythm. It just works with the way that my brain works. And it's really easy for me if I ever get bored of the sounds I've gotten there to just start a new pack, load it onto there, switch to it, and have a bunch of sounds dumped into it or recorded into it. It's lovely for that. And once again, I know it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but it's my go to casual music production device. But I can get what I consider to be some pretty polished results out of it at the same time. And so for me, it's almost perfect, oddly enough. As much as I love my circuits, if I want what I would consider to be kind of a perfect travel device with a more robust synth engine and some more features, I'm pretty much always gonna reach for the Roland MC-101.
The MC-101 is a bit of a chunkier device, but it has an even smaller footprint than the circuits. And it has more features, plain and simple, a more robust, better, uh, more polished sounding synth engine, definitely the Roland sound, which will be a huge draw for a lot of people. It turns samples into synths a little bit better, I think, and gives you a few more features for that, and has a bunch of extra stuff built in, including multi-track export, which allows me to make a beat on the go, jam it out live, and then take those individual tracks and really give them the polish that they need. That's a fantastic combination for me. I think that kind of feature set should be standard across standalone music production devices at this point, just my opinion. And it's almost close to the perfect device for me. The workflow definitely isn't as good as the circuits, and that's the thing I think that holds it back the most. But even then, you can absolutely get used to it. It really isn't that bad once you get your head around it and learn a bunch of shortcuts. So that's my go-to travel device. I will mention, I have been finding myself reaching for the MC-707 more and more these days. I'm not officially putting it on this list yet, but I'm starting to believe that it just might be the Circuit Pro of my dreams. I'll come back to that in a future video, potentially, but I'll leave it at that for now. It's hands-on sound design capabilities with full access to the Zencore synth engine, increased track count, and all the features of the 101 in a much more spread out intuitive device are pretty sweet. We'll come back to that in a future video. but. Speaking of expensive devices, let's move on to the final thing on this list, the Akai MPC-1. The MPC-1 is the best iteration of a DAW in a box approach that I've seen on a standalone device. And I've used a few of them at this point. There's kind of a gamut of rigid structure on one end and basically just a computer with the license plates changed on the other end. The MPC does the best job that I've seen of being basically a fully fledged piece of music production software crammed into a piece of hardware without really killing the hands-on approach. I've also used the Machine Plus in the past and I like the workflow for that better, but the MPC has more power for what I use it for and it's quite a bit less expensive and it takes up just a slightly smaller footprint. Overall, I've already gotten a ton of mileage out of mine. And if I wanna make something that's properly polished, that's gonna be the thing that I reach for. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. So far, I've discovered that it's got all the power I need to handle whatever I throw at it. And of course, it's got the legendary MPC sample chopping features. Uh, at this point, some fairly robust built-in synth plugins with quite a bit of hands-on control as well, and a ton of other cool features like auto sampler, splice integration, and CV connectivity. That last thing I don't personally use, but some people will find that super appealing. There are definitely some some huge frustrations I've run into with the device because some of the workflow feels janky or unfinished or like it was designed by two separate teams who didn't really bother talking to each other. But overall, I was able to get used to most of it and it's pretty smooth to use at this point. So that's the list so far. And hopefully this gives you a good idea of the different use cases of each device, at least in my opinion, and what the draw and drawbacks of each device would be. No device on this list is perfect. They all have trade-offs. And that's something that I'm gonna dig into in a video next week. The fact that the perfect groove box for me still doesn't exist. A lot of devices on this list have gotten close, but they all have at least one feature or one aspect that they miss out on, whether it's portability, workflow, extra features like multi-track export, or something else that I've forgotten at the moment. They all have different compromises made to try to make a device that fit the priorities that the manufacturer and developers were looking for. So I'm gonna get into that next week. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Uh, let me know in the comments down below what your favorite standalone music production device is, and I'll be back with a new video in a little bit. Peace.